No fear, hate speech is not welcome here. No fear, hate speech is not welcome here. All love, no fear, hate speech is not welcome here. All love, no fear, hate speech is not welcome here. All love, no fear, hate speech is not welcome here. Welcome, welcome. It is a beautiful Saturday, and I am so happy to see all of your lovely faces here. Today is a day that we stand in solidarity with Charlottesville, and we denounce white supremacy. My name is Amy Lewis, and I am one of the core Black Lives Matter Lansing members, and I am very excited to be here with you. Today, we bring love and patience into this space. We wanna make sure that we uplift each other. Last week was unmentionable. <sighs> we, we speak Heather Heyer's name because white supremacy kills. As we speak Heather Heyer's name, we also speak Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, Trayvon Martin, because white supremacy kills. And today, we bring love. The core principle for Black Lives Matter Lansing is loving engagement. So what we get to do right now, you get to love on your neighbor just a little bit. You're gonna turn to your neighbor, say, hey neighbor. Say, hey neighbor. Hey neighbor. And what I want you to do is I want you to tell your neighbor something that you love about them. And if you don't know your neighbor, guess what? You get to know your neighbor right now. So turn to your neighbor and tell them something that you love about them. Nice, nice, nice. I feel the love. I feel it. I feel it. Now, I want to bring your attention to some people that are standing right behind me, standing in solidarity, people that have our back, people that have your back. We have some elected officials and some clergy members here. Let's go ahead and give them a nice warm welcome and a round of applause. I would also uh, like to acknowledge MSU's President Simon um, for making safety of all students a top priority by rejecting a platform for white supremacy because white supremacy kills. And if at any time during this rally you need any assistance, there are people walking around with clipboards and um, some other folks that are ensuring that we are safe within this day within this rally. So now, at this time, we are going to have our first performance. This person is a fierce hip hop artist, and he is extremely dedicated to the youth here in Lansing. He has um, uh, fundraised thousands of dollars for scholarships, for the arts. It's absolutely wonderful. At this time, I would like for us to welcome Mr. Mikey Austin. What's up, everybody? How's everyone doing? I want to try this. When I say black lives, you say matter. Black lives. Black lives. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So events like these, they're always a good thing and a bad thing. They're good because it's always amazing to see people come together standing in solidarity and standing together and fighting, but it lets us know that racism still exists. It lets us know that bigotry still exists. It lets us know that homophobia still exists. And uh, today in my quiet time, I was reminded that our voice has so much power and our voice matters. So make some noise if your voice matters. So today I'm gonna do a poem to start it off and then we're gonna get this going, all right? So this is called Live from the Concrete. Having a hard time trying to define a man Cause what's unseen is hard to comprehend And if I'm not taught, how can I understand? No offense, but the broken homes and shattered hearts inspire me to grab a pen Many afternoons were spent playing ball and broken rims Which means even if it goes in, our shots are still slim Opportunities have always been paper thin So I grabbed a paper and a pen and wrote rhymes to thicken it Where I come from, nothing is given, nothing is handed So I took a paintbrush and laid it down on the canvas In front of the police station, paint a picture that is candid And watch I lay the crowd snapping like a bunch of camera seats Every moment cause you don't know when your last will be In a life where life is taken so casually In a life where lives are taken so casually But got a badge and kill someone and suffer no casualties Blessed are those who hunger and thirst I beg your pardon, I'm blessed beyond measure because I'm a starving artist and yesterday is gone but it don't seem far away never had a penny to our name we went through things the harder way who would have thought quotes from Garvey Malcolm and King would bring your gym seeds to the front of the scene tried to cut us at the roots didn't know that we were seeds so we just kept growing despite in the concrete and deep into the afternoon, I was in that concrete Practicing my crossover, making sure it was elite My uncles told me, practice and you can be anything Should have been a referee instead, I was born with stripes against me I hung the kicks up and bought a microphone and a stand Practicing what they told me were my only two options Black man, black man, what you doing, where you going? This world has a way of taking your dreams and ambitions For brothers like me College is intimidating, especially when nobody in your family has graduated. Plus, what's a degree for a brother like me? Jobs ain't promised when you got dreadlocks in their rings. Qualifications are few, that's why we MC. Recommendations are from the streets, that's why they sell weed. Never voted likely to succeed, but that didn't bother me. I just tapped with the votes to prove a point to those who slept on me. Never was a first round pick, I sat in the bench watching I peep game. Now I can't get like soccer, so I'm vivid enough to win this black man at Oscar. From the slums, I became an MC godfather. Tell me why do my people die? Bullets ain't got name, but skin surely attracts they aim. Who do I trust when the police is just another blue gang? And the congregation starving while passes flying in jet planes. Hard to stay in your lane when you ain't got enough. Looking at our president like, really, who can I trust? Freedom's mad expensive and my family was cheap. I'm looking down the family line like I guess it's gonna be me. When I say black lives, you say matter. Black lives, yeah. black lives. Yeah. When I say black lives, you say matter. Black lives, yeah. black lives. Yeah. Thank you for your time. introduce our next speaker. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Black Lives Matter Lansing. As I told you before, our core principle is loving engagement. And what are we doing with that love and engagement? Right now, we have three spectacular goals that we are working on relentlessly. We have been working with um, the upcoming local elections with 20XX. Campaign 20XX. If you don't know about it, go on Facebook, like us, and you will learn about it. We have hosted town halls, and we will host um, a debate coming up on September 26th, Election 20XX. And within those goals of Election 20XX, XX, we want to increase police accountability. We want to do that by having an elected police commission. Goal number two, we want to divest in the war on black people and invest in the black community. So what does that look like? 
that looks like an eradication of food deserts. It looks like ensuring that we can have mixed income housing for all of the new housing apartment complexes that we see. And our last goal is to make sure that we emphasize the need for Lansing to be a freedom city where all people are safe here in Lansing. And now I will invite another Black Lives Matter Lansing Corps member, actually one of the founding Black Lives Matter Lansing members, Ms. LaShawn Irby. Hey everybody! Hey. Well, that's a good sound sister. <laughs> Thank y'all so much for coming out today. I'm really, really excited to see you. I have some prepared notes. Thank you for that. So, first of all, our first speaker for today, I'm very honored to introduce, he is our state Senator. Curtis Hertel Jr. was elected in 2014 to serve Michigan's 23rd Senate District, which encompasses most of Ingham County. Prior to his time in the state Senate, Hertel served as an Ingham County Commissioner from 2001 until 2008. The legislative uh, liaison for the Department of Community Health under Grand Governor Granholm from 2008 to 2005 to 2008, and Ingham County Register of Deeds from 2009 until 2015. Curtis Hertel Jr. has a long history of fighting for issues that matter to most Michigan families. At the age of tender 22, Hertel was elected to the Ingham County Commission where he was a champion for the county's living wage ordinance, successfully fought to save Potter Park Zoo, led the charge for the Ingham County Health Plan, which became a model around the country, and spearheaded a number of important initiatives that streamlined services for Ingham County residents. As the county's register of deeds, Hertel became a champion for people that had fallen victim to predatory lending and foreclosure scams. By filing suit against our country's most powerful banking institutions, he helped shield residents from foreclosure fraud. Please put your hands together to welcome our state senator, Curtis Hertel Jr. Thank you very much, LaShawn. I gotta tell you, it's a great honor to be invited here uh, to speak. And I have to admit uh, that for me, uh, you know, I I'm a cisgender, straight, white male, middle class, living in America. So I got a lot of privilege to check, and I think in many ways it's my job to be listening instead of speaking right now. But I also speak for a lot of you in the state capitol. And what I want to say is, is that I think it's easy to call out racism when it's carrying a tiki torch or uh, you know, wearing khakis and a white shirt or a hood. Uh, it should be easy for all of us, apparently not the president, but, that, but it should be easy to call out that kind of racism. But my job is to call out the other kind of racism that happens in this building and they're from the state of Michigan every single day. That's yeah. my thing. In Michigan, people of color are three times more likely to live in poverty. African Americans are six more times than uh, white people that look like me to be incarcerated. Um, more likely to end up in a failing school. And, and if you don't like numbers, we can just talk about what happened in Flint. For over a year, people were having community meetings, talking about their water, talking about how it smelled funny, talking about the, uh, the color of it. We saw increased levels of lead poisoning. We had people that died from Legionnaire's disease. You cannot tell me that if, it, if Flint, the average person living in Flint looked like me and had my resources, that that would have been put up with for any length of time. It happened for one reason, we all know that. So 
So we have a responsibility to stand up and fight back. The world has changed many times. Yes, the world changed because of people like Lincoln and Johnson and Obama that were in power. It changed because of civil rights leaders like Rosa Parks, Harvey Milk, Dr. King, Mar Malcolm X, Susan B. Anthony, Cesar Chavez, Walter Ruther, and A. Philip Rand Randolph. It changed because of all those people. But it mostly didn't change because of one leader. It changed because people like you. Average, everyday people who stood up and fought back over and over again. Yeah. I am a patriot. We are all patriots. This idea that people on the left aren't patriots yes. is garbage. So I don't have to say that. We're all patriots. I love my country. But I love my country not as a child loves their parent. I love my country as an adult loves their parent. When you actually look and see their flaws, when you go and see what they're doing and, and want to make changes, that's the way I love my country. 240 years ago, America started as an imperfect union. But it was a revolutionary idea of self-governance. It took us 90 years to end slavery, 60 years for women's suffrage, another 40 years for the civil rights movement, another 60 years before marriage equality. All that being said, the history of America is a struggle for equality. That is our history. We are not going to let them take that from us. The long arc of history does bend towards justice. But not on its own, not just because that's the right thing, not because it's just moral. It's because good people like you stand up every single day and fight for it. We have a responsibility to be that change. For some of us, 2018 was a wake-up call. For many of us, we have been living in this nightmare for far too long. It does not matter, we are all awake now. Yes, we are! What I can promise you, on my end, what I'm asking from you as well, we will march, we will activate, we will fight, and in 2018, we will take Michigan back and we will take this yes. country back yes. to the people. Yes. Thank you very much. These are my kids, by the way. Thank you so much. God bless you. Keep fighting, everybody. One more time, let's put it together for Senator Hurt. I was taking pictures, I forgot I have back up here. Okay, so our next speaker, I'm so excited to welcome to the stage this morning. Her name is Reverend Desiree Kelly Cato, and she became the first licensed woman as an associate minister of the Union Missionary Baptist Church in April of 1995. In April 2000, she became the second woman ordained. She has served in various ministries over the 32 years at Union. She currently serves as the superintendent of Sunday school, teaching the women's, women's classes. She's a, a vacation Bible school teacher and assists Pastor Jones in various duties and ministries at Union. She received a Bachelor of Arts degree at Spring Arbor College, majoring in secondary education. She is a widow and was married to Jonathan Cato for 31 years. They were blessed to be parents to two daughters and she is in love with her three-year-old grandson, Gerald, which you see on the stage today. <laughs> Reverend Cato has, has done several, several speaking engagements in various venues, in churches, workshops, colleges, and community functions. During her 12 years as a program coordinator and advocate at the Capital Area Response Program, she received three community awards. In 2014, Greater Lansing Area Chapter, National Association of Business and Professional Women, the Sojourner Truth Award. 2013, right? Capital Area Women's Magazine, caring about women locally. And then also in 2013, the Lansing State Journal, Greater Lansing Woman of the Year. Yeah. So I want to just 
publicly thank you for agreeing to do this. This was um, a last minute invitation. Um, many of you may know, may or may not know, but uh, Pastor Melvin T. Jones is the co-president of Action of Greater Lansing. He's a senior pastor at Union Missionary Baptist Church, and he's also one of the co-founding members of Black Lives Matter Lansing. He's on vacation. <laughs> She's gonna handle up though, I promise you. I welcome my sister beloved, Reverend Kato. Please come forward. Welcome everybody. Welcome. Sean, thank you so much. When she asked me just yesterday to speak, the first song that came to mind was a song that I have not hummed or sung for years. And it's written by a Woody Gontry. And it says, this land is your land. This land is your land from California to New York Island, from the Redfoot Forest to the Gulf Stream water. This land was made for you and me. As I was walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley, this land was made for you and me. No apologies anymore. We belong here, yes. every one of us. This land was made for you and me. No mistakes anymore. This land was made for you and me. He writes, I, as I roamed and rumbled and followed my footsteps, to the sparkling sands of her diamond desert, and all around me a voice was sounding, this land was made for you and me. When the sun came shining and I was strolling, and the wheat fields waving and the dust clouds growing, a voice was chanting and a fog was lifting, this land was made for you and me. Today as we come together in solidarity to reaffirm the whole truth and nothing but the truth are chanting voices together, showing diversity, celebrating who we are, acknowledging our ancestors, knowing that the sweat and blood of tears of all of us has made this land what it is. This land was made for you and me. the back and the labor of our hands, the sweat of our blood and tears, the truth of diminishing, the truth as we diminish the notion of superior race, we diminish those voices that says there is no diversity, there is more than diversity here, there is more of representation here, there is more of community here, there is more of kindred spirit here, this land was made for you and me. We are Americans, we do acknowledge where we come from, but this land was made for you and me. As we follow the footsteps we love in action, we lift up now and forevermore our brother and our sisterly love. We lift up that fog denouncing disturbance violence that divides us, that divides family and neighbors and co-workers and friends. Instead, we chant for equality and fair opportunity and education and in marriage and in housing and employment and immigration and fair trade. We denounce the continual building and privatizing of prisons and criminal laws that continue to lengthen for the people of color, only for the purpose to tear down families, to dehumanize our work, to target and mark our youth, and to systemize a welfare that caused dependency from one generation to the next. We do not roam aimlessly, but with a purpose and a vision that all lives matter, that black lives matter, that we stand connected as one, that our common denominator is greater than what separates us. And that what separates us only gives us an opportunity to talk and understand. Because we are who we are. We are patrons. We are Americans. We stand here. Visibly I stand here with a Nigerian outfit that I know is my blood. 
But to look at me, you would be surprised that half of my blood is Irish. In other words, I stand here not just by what I look like, but who I am. So who are you today? Are you representing your neighbor? Who are you today? Are you representing the whole or just a few? We come together establishing that we are a part of the whole. And what makes the whole what it is, is who we are. Who are you today? We are Americans. We are the LGBTQIAA. I am an ally. We stand believing that who we are by denomination, regardless of what faith we stand for, we are one. We stand identifying our own gender and not apologizing for who we are. We are who we are. celebrate our differences in our race, if love will celebrate our various culture and our religion, love will conquer the education of the ignorance of our neighbors and our family and our friends that hide behind Facebook, that hide behind social media, and give de derogatory words and terms, but yet when we see them face to face to educate them, they refuse to talk to us. all about. Talk to me. Get to know me. Because my blood still sheds the same as you. But how do we use this God-given filial love, this love of friendship? We treat our neighbors as ourselves. We pray for those who are fighting for equality, those legal attorneys and prosecutors and advocates who are running against the system. It's amazing that Gantry himself, when he discovered that he was living in a place that was owned by James Trump, who blocked the entry and the attendance of black tenants coming into their own place, he refused to renew his lease. Instead, he rewrote another song. And this is the same guy that wrote, this land is your land. He rewrote these words from a song that he had already written. It was titled, I Ain't Got No Home. I suppose old man Trump knows just how much racial hate he stirred up in the blood pot of the human heart when he drew that colored line here at 1800 Family Project. Again, he's talking about when he leased in 1950 at Beach Haven Apartments. Beach Haven ain't my home. I just can't pay this rent. My money's down the drain and my soul is badly bent. Beach Haven looks like heaven where no black ones come to roam. No, 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 old man Trump, no Beach Haven ain't my home. And so, if he can write, this land is my land, and turn around and show James Trump where his money is, then we have a responsibility to not only put our money where our mouth is, to be vigilant of where we, where we buy, purchase items, but we also need to be responsible for educating individuals that hide behind the cloak of bigotry, that hide behind the cloak of racism, that hide behind that cloak of violence. My grandson, three years old, because of his color, has a target on his back. But Michelle Obama said that when they go low, we go high. When they go low, we, we go, go high. high. When they go low, we, we go high. This land was made for you and me. This land was made for you and me. This land was made for you and me. What makes this land what it is is us, you, me, 
diversity, celebration, educating, because when those that have and those that do not have, when there's a split of division, then no one wins. And so I end with my faith. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, his spiritual mentor, his second letter, he's incarcerated in Rome. And he says this, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Do you have love today? Say yes. Do you have the power of the people? Say yes. Do you have a sound mind of self-control? Say yes. Do you have a sound mind to collectively work together? Say yes. Are we a whole? Go forth. Next, we get to have an incredible drum master come and play for us. She is actually my mentor, my drum mentor. I love her to death. She fights tires tirelessly for women's rights. She fights tirelessly for queer rights. I love her to death. Please welcome Miss Pele Young. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is written across many, many cultures that we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. They brought my great-great-grandparents over here, but they didn't take our drums. All right, all right, all right. They brought my grandparents over here and they didn't take my God-given birthright of African music. Everyone on this planet has a heritage. With 23andMe, Ancestry.com, Check your DNA. And then look at whose shoulders you stand on. When you find out, you'll realize there, that you are actually a compilation of many heritage. Many, many heritages. I am black. I'm Northern European, I'm Native American, yeah. and I am Polynesian. Look at each heritage. Learn the stories and teachings of each heritage. When you look across each heritage and their belief systems, you will see that only one thing matters, and that is love. So as we stand here together in love, in light of what has happened over the last week, I want you to remember those who have shed their blood for us. Because you know what? 
they're fine on the other side. And they're now those ancestors' shoulders that we are standing on. And so it is.
today in less than 24 hours notice. You deserve a round of applause. Thank you for showing love to every member of our community. Without all of you, we cannot win. With all of you, we know we will win. Right. It is my great honor to introduce a lovely human being, yes. a passionate human being, one of our newest core members who really helped organize everything that came together today. Jordan X. Evans, if you attended, how many of you attended the forum back in May at Union Missionary Baptist Church? Anybody? You people will make sure that you're here at the at the debate September 26. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? There you go. September 26, election 20 XX debate. We need you there. I give you now Jordan X Evans the moderator of the Election 20XX Forum, one of the only events to provide a platform for every candidate of every city office to respond to questions that affect the black, brown, marginalized, LGBTQ, new American communities. Speak, girl, speak. Do not allow people who don't represent your interests to choose your candidates for you. Right. Every election matters. Right. Who represents us matters. Download the city leadership guide and find out what your candidates had to say about our issues and vote accordingly. Jordan X. Evans, you beautiful human being, <laughs> please come and share your love. When I say black lives, you say matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. matter. We're gonna do that again. It's kind of quiet in here. It's kind of quiet. When I say black lives, you say matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. matter. First off, I want to thank you for coming out, for making this possible. Um, a lot of you I've talked to, and they were like, uh, "What happened? I didn't have any notice." Us either, we put it together in 24 hours. <laughs> so thank you for coming out. I wanna thank my big sisters, Angela, LaShawn, Amy, for the love, support, and trusting me to come speak to y'all. <laughs> um, so today I wanna to speak about a few themes that have been on the hot seat and on my mind for the last day, the weekend, month, years, decades. And those are love, fear, and notions of white supremacy. This is a story about me, but I'd argue it's also a story about us. It's about you, period, S, period, the US. First topic I'd like to discuss is about love. I'm mixed. I'm black, white, half black, half white, fully amazing. <laughs> Both of my parents were born and raised here in the capital city. They went to Everett. Do I have any Vikings in the house? Any Vikings? <laughs> my dad met my mom when he would skip his algebra class to go flirt with her in the band classroom. Um, he failed, she passed, but I guess he won and a few years later, I came about. Um, they had a mixed child. 
They had me. They had a mixed child, and my grandfather kicked her out of the family. He made it so we could not go to family functions unless they were specifically designed for us. Yet, through this whole ordeal, my parents continued to give me all the love in the world. My mother easily could have taken her anger, her sadness, and her pain out on me. Instead, she loved me. And she took that anger and put it into her education. She graduated with a bachelor's degree from MSU. Um, what is it? Who will? Spartans will? And she did. She had the will to succeed no matter the lack of family support that she received from her family. And while she hit the books, my dad was in the Navy, which meant that a lot of babysitting duties fell upon my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents. It takes a community to raise a child. And I felt the love from every single one of them. If it wasn't for them, I would not be here today. There's no way. Which leads me to fear. My grandmother on my mom's side led a daycare. And I experienced the fear that most children fear, the boogeyman. In my grandmother's basement, there was a red, bright door. And in this bright red door next to the play area, we were told that the boogeyman lives down there. And like most kids, we make stories. The boogeyman lives in there, he works. And at one point, there was a kid that was so bad, he took the kid and punished him with steel and hammers. And to this day, we can still hear the screams and the moans of that child being punished. Well, one day, all the other children left the daycare. I'm sitting there alone with my family members. And we're waiting because my mom's still at school. She's still working. She's running a little bit behind as any hardworking family units do. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> so, all of a sudden, my aunt and uncle, or my aunt's cousins and grandmother, we all hear a door shut. We hear a, a silence. And in that silence, I hear fear. I see the, the, the sadness and the scared looks of my cousins. And I don't know what to do. So they, they whisper and hush and tell me to go run under the bed. Go run under the bed and hide. So we're playing hide and seek. I'm five years old. What do I do? What do I do? So next thing I know, I'm just creeping and crawling under the bed to the kitchen, to the back door. And out of the back door, I run and jump in a car. I escaped the boogeyman that day. The boogeyman was my grandfather. He was, a, he was a white supremacist that was okay with hate and dividing our family. I mentioned my dad's side of the family. Dad's side of the family, we had different conversations, different experiences. These experiences were amazing and enlightening and also over the top, over my head, because as many black children in this nation, I was taught to be afraid of cops. I was taught to be afraid of my blackness. I was taught to be afraid that I could die at any moment. The conversations we had were, Jordan, don't wear that hoodie. If you wear that hoodie when it's not raining, you could be killed. When you talk to a cop, ask for your parents, ask for a lawyer, which I asked my grandmother, what does a lawyer mean? Boy, if you don't start, stop asking these questions. <laughs> so, if you do talk to a cop, enunciate every word. Grandmother, what does enunciate mean? <laughs> Boy, stop asking these childish questions. You know what it means, just talk slowly and clearly like those teachers told you. There was fear in their voice, in my grandmother's and my uncle's voices as they told me these lessons. The fear that I could be taken away from them at any moment. Which leads me to my final quick memory. My mom and I were in the car, we were driving, and she stopped and we had to get gas. And she turned around and looked at me and said, Jordan, stay in the car. She locked the door and I could see she was uh, a shaking mess. So I wonder what's going on. I get nosy and peek over the top. What's going on? What's going on? She goes talk to an elderly white man. 
gray hair, no beard, no mustache, skinny, kind of like the guy you'd see at a Finley's on a Sunday at a 10, 10 a.m. <laughs> and she comes back visibly shaken. She's crying, tears in her eyes. So like any child of five years old, mom, mommy, mom, mom, mommy, mama, mama, and she ignores me. So I continue to do my stewie. Mommy, mom, 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 what's going on? She tells me, that was your grandfather there. That was the grandfather that you'll never meet. And she was shaken, so I kept asking questions, but how do you explain this to five, a five-year-old about what notions of white supremacy are, what racism is? How do you have these conversations? And like many of pe people in this country, she opted out. So, like any other child that's got two families that love them dearly, I went to the other family. What? Why can't I see this man? What is racism? Why does he not accept me for me? Is there something wrong with me? And they told me. They explained what racism was. They explained to me why I have to wear, I can't wear a hoodie with a hood up. They explained to me why I can't walk around with Skittles at night. They taught me these harmful and scary lessons at five years old because I needed to hear them. And I'm telling you them now because you need to hear them. Because we can look at both sides of my family and say, they loved me. They did everything to support me and keep me safe. But let's talk about my family that instead of confronting this racist man, would rather hide me. How many of you struggle to talk to your family members about racism? All of you, most of you, it's a struggle. It's hard. But we cannot opt out. We cannot. How many more people are gonna be wondering what is wrong with them at five years old? How many more people are gonna be hurt? How many more Trayvon Martins must we see? How much more pain do we have to have before you step up instead of opting out. I argue that my family stands for America in so many ways, and in this story, that's just one of many. They represent America today because we are witnessing those ways, those fears and ways our white family members refuse to stand up, speak out, and dismantle the systems that they have profited from. While my brothers and sisters who are black, Native American, Muslim, disabled, queer, transgender, are all afraid that they will be harassed, attacked, tortured, raped, and killed, and targeted by acts of terrorism. Of course we are all fearful and outraged at Nazis and the KKK. Those are visible. They make it clear what their thoughts are. But how do we confront covert racism? How do we... Con uh, Attack, I almost fell down the stairs, sorry. <laughs> um, but how do we attack these systems that are harmful? We should be livid that our neighbors, friends, and allies are more afraid to upset the status quo of law and order than creating a country based off justice and humanity. My cousins, aunts, grandmother were more fearful of standing up to delusions of white supremacy and hate than the love of my humanity. They accepted my otherness and believed I should be hidden. It was more important to them that I was hidden than to say black lives mattered and defend that. They would rather stay silent about race and the notion of white supremacy in their own family. So for those, they're now wondering what delusions of white supremacy are. Why are we here? What are we trying to actually take down? I have some words for you taken from the Boston Resist White Supremacy Social Media Toolkit. White supremacy is the idea that white people are morally and ethnically superior to all other people, especially black people, and those people should cease to exist. White supremacy is not just about people in hoods, nor can be reduced to people who are poor, rural, white, and uneducated. White supremacy is a web of violent, abusive behaviors bolstered by white supremacists, racist elected officials, violent police and law enforcement, and corporate money. White supremacy is a web of violent and abusive behaviors towards anyone who's not white, or as we saw from the murder of Heather Heyer, white people who stand against hate intended to sign significantly harm or kill. It may look differently in each circumstance, but often takes the form of racial, gender, and religious-based violence. 
It can be seen in our family's refusal to discuss these systems. They can be seen when a wall of children form a wall to harass a person of color, like what happened here in DeWitt. Notions of white supremacy takes the form of spray painting doors which spell out lewd comments about our Lansing sisters who are queer. It can be seen in the way our government poisoned tens of thousands of Flint residents who are still today struggling to get clean water. It can be seen by the DOJ, headed by Sessions and number 45, targeting several cities with federal troops that all share common quality. Lansing is included in that quality as we want to be sanctuary and freedom cities. Clearly, the violence last week was unacceptable, and another notion, another notion of white supremacy working. But Charlottesville is not an isolated event. While you are all here with us to condone those hateful acts, then we must also condone and con condemn the con covert and oppressive systems that we face in our own households. I want to remind you of the famous words of James Baldwin. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you do not see. This is a challenge for you to speak up, not just about the daily, to speak up daily at the dinner table when your aunt and uncle makes a racist joke. This is to speak up when your boss or coworker makes a sexist joke. This is to speak up. This is to speak up and push back against voting acts that are being stripped state by state. I ask you to not agonize, but to organize. What I need from you now is to get on social media and call out your elected officials to demand that President 45 explicitly denounce white nationalist supremacists and all other hate groups. I need you to sit down and talk to your family members. I need you to call those officials at their offices, demand the removal of all Confederate monuments across the U.S., commit to the efforts to ensure all eligible voters get a fair shake in the midterms in every election following that. And today we have a few groups that are actually doing that work. We have one group specifically, Voters Not Politicians, which are trying to get signatures to end gerrymandering. Go sign it. Black Lives Matter's here. Hit us up, like our page. We need you, we need allies. And I know we can do this, so let's make the capital city, state, nation, hear us. So repeat after me. When I say black, black lives, you say matter. Black lives, matter. Black lives, matter. Black lives, matter. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, and I'm handing back over to you. Thank you, Jordan. Right on. He said, speak up. Stand out. Speak up against injustices. Give Jordan another round of applause. So there are several people that we have to thank and acknowledge for making this possible. Uh, right now, I really want to first thank all of you for being here. Your action of being here shows that you care. It shows that you want change. So first of all, thank you. Next, I'd like to thank uh, Capitol staff um, uh, for our, all of uh, the safety measures that they have. Um, uh, thank you to them. And then um, uh, last but certainly not least, um, volunteers and the Black Lives Matter members, Black Lives Matter allies, Black Lives Matter core members. all of the clergy and all um, of the elected officials that have come through. Thank you guys so much. So as we close, I want to emphasize the importance of being anti-hate and being anti-racist. The stance of being anti is something that is actionable. It's something that you do. It's nothing that you can just ignore and pretend that it will go away. It 
If you don't do something, no one will. If we don't do something, no one will. We must be the change that we seek. So I am very, very, very happy for all of us being here in solidarity. Yeah, for us to be here in solidarity to denounce white supremacy and to bring about love. I have to really thank my family. They're in Kansas City, Missouri. Hey, hey. Um, <laughs> family and my girlfriend. Right there. Um, and so uh, as we close, we're going to do some more chanting. And um, uh, before we leave, as we chant, we're going to come up onto the stairs of the Capitol. We're going to get a really, really good picture of all of us together. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, it is. But before we do that, we're going to let me take a selfie. Isn't that how it goes? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>